Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. And today it's my pleasure to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Jeff Gaske, an imager and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy expert to discuss with us some exciting new work related to new treatment approaches for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Historically, it was surgery or catheter-based interventions to physically change uh, the outflow tract obstruction. So, Jeff, first of all, welcome. Thanks for having me. And maybe tell us a little bit about what sort of drug is Mavicamptin? How do you yeah, say I, it and how does it work? Why do they always make these drug names so tough to say? <laughs> I, but uh, yeah, Mavicamptin is, uh, is a new drug. It's not yet FDA approved, but has been going through some phase three clinical trials, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but this is uh, a new mechanism. This is so. This is not like a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker or disapyramide, some of those staple uh, regimens that we're used to using in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But instead, this is a targeted inhibitor of cardiac myosin. So it essentially reduces the number of actin myosin cross bridges, and in doing so, it is a direct negative inotrope. It, it decreases contractility. And um, in a condition like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where there's excess cross-linking, there's too much muscle contracting too hard, a drug that empirically targets contractility without targeting chronotropic effects um, is, uh, is a new player. Very interesting. Um, what do we know about its use in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So um, it's, a, it's, it's a good question. And again, I would say it's not yet FDA approved as of this recording. That, that may or may not change in the near future. But there have been a number of different trials that have looked at this agent. Um, so the, some, one of the first trials was the Pioneer trial. This is a phase two trial. And this trial looked at Mavicamptin in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and saw that it reduced post-exercise outflow tract gradient it increased peak oxygen consumption at VO2 treadmill. It was seen to decrease the ejection fraction as one might expect for a negative inotrope or something that reduces contractility. And it improved symptoms. Um, there was a, st a study that looked at this drug in non-obstructive disease that was called Maverick HCM. And that was a phase two clinical trial, uh, placebo controlled trial in non-obstructive disease. It was seen to reduce natriuretic peptides in that group, so some physiologic effect in, in that uh, way, but did not change echodiastolic parameters, KCCQ, or VO2 data. Um, the first phase three trial was this trial called Explorer, and Explorer was a randomized placebo-controlled trial of 251 patients, the majority of which were NYHA class two. And what we saw is that it reduced outflow tract gradient, it increased the VO2, it improved symptoms, and it seemed to be fairly well tolerated, similar to placebo, but 11% had a transient drop in their ejection fraction below 50%. So it's something that we noticed kind of as we monitor in trials. And then the most recent trial just released at ACC 22 is one called Valor. And Valor was really looking at patients with more advanced disease. So NYHA class three uh, patients with severe obstruction considering septa reduction therapy. And I think we've, we've kind of learned that in that group, this drug likely has a role as well. So what kind of changes do you expect to see? What sort of either anatomic changes when you're looking at an echocardiogram, physiologic changes, you mentioned gradients, what are the side effects? Well, you talked about, you mentioned low EF briefly, but let's first talk about the changes we see uh, because the natural question that comes up is this is terrific, a drug that does surgery for you, so to speak, but can you give too much of it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. And I think um, I'll, I'll have to start with a caveat in that we, we know what happens in clinical trial settings. So these are very closely monitored settings. And we know what happens in the acute clinical trial setting. We, we really don't know much about long-term use of this drug for safety outcomes, for tolerance, for uh, dur durability of effect. So we, we don't know those things. And I think 
So the, the, the rest of my answer really pertains to clinical trial associated acute yeah. effects. And um, what we can say from that is that this drug seems to have a fairly potent effect on reducing outflow tract gradient. So uh, if we look in, in the Valor trial, the one that we were just discussing, that's a great trial to look at this because the gradients were so high to start. So to enter into the trial, you had to have a gradient of 50, so severe alpha tract obstruction. And what we saw is that in, in patients, their resting gradient in the placebo group stayed right around 50, it was 46 plus or minus 29. And at 16 weeks of this drug use in the Navicamptin group, it dropped down to 14 plus or minus nine. So a fairly large drop there. And then if you look at provocation, you know, post Valsalva, uh, we saw that the gradient was 78 in the placebo group and 28 in the Mavicampton group. So a fairly large drop in outflow tract obstruction. Now, I, the, one of the questions was, you know, is this, is this kind of a, a septa reduction as a drug? We haven't really seen data to suggest that wall thickness or cardiac mass substantially changes. I, I think that's an area of interest and in, in understanding if this drug, as it changes the actin myosin cross-linking, does it promote remodeling in, in a good fashion? Um, I, I think stay tuned. Um, I, I don't believe that we've de demonstrated definitively that that occurs, no, nor though have we said that it doesn't occur. And so I think that, that that is something that may be coming. Um, we do know from a biomarker standpoint, though, that the troponin and the NT pro BMP fall in the setting of this drug. So suppose it were approved tomorrow, who would you offer this to? Uh, we've been doing septal reduction surgery for years. We know it's safe. The risk, the morbidity, mortality are very low, but it's surgery. Uh, and obviously, you know, the other arm in the armamentarium are, uh, are alcohol septal reduction. Who gets what? Yeah, and that's a, that's a good question. And I think the landscape of treatment of this disease is a, would, would shift if this uh, drug was approved uh, tomorrow. Um, the, the most recent guideline update really clearly emphasizes the utmost importance to procedural experience for sept reduction therapy, both myectomy and alcohol ablation, that is critical. And so at a place like Mayo Clinic, where we have such high volume, high experience, incredible outcomes, for many people, the answer is still sept reduction. It's a, it's a procedure, it carries with it procedural risks, it carries with it downsides of a procedure, but it is a single procedure. And if a patient's goal is to get off of medication, that's really the way to go. Um, now, others may say, listen, I don't have access to Mayo Clinic for procedures, or I'm uh, quite worried about a procedure like an open heart surgery or an alcohol ablation. Uh, I want to maximize medical efforts before I would proceed with that. I think that's where this drug may find a role. And the uh, most recent study, this Valor study that uh, Mayo was a participant in, I was the, the site principal investigator for this trial, really looked at the role of this drug on top of existing therapies. So uh, this was on top of beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and even some patients were on triple therapy of beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and disapyramide. This is the first study to really incorporate disapyramide use as well to say that this is now a a fourth class of drugs that we can really consider in this group. So, you know, one of the interesting things in my mind, as you know, many of us have had an interest in using the AIECG, where we apply convolutional neural networks, so artificial intelligence process into a standard ECG, teach it patterns in thousands or millions of patients to detect things that human expert readers can't detect. What are your thoughts on using that as a marker to say, you're dosing the drug properly or you're on the edge of giving too much, um, please comment. Yeah, so first off, I wanna say that that work is fantastic. Um, our, our Mayo electronic medical record gives us access to this and it's something that I access clinically when I'm seeing my patients with HCM or who are being screened 
for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's something that I access. And uh, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir with you here, uh, Paul, but you know, we, this, this tool certainly has uh, benefit in ejection fraction assessment, looking for higher low ejection fraction. And uh, in my mind, one of the things that we'll have to carefully monitor with this drug, even though it's not occurring in the majority of individuals, and when the drug is withheld, it seems that an ejection fraction that's fallen improves, there is a signal that this drug can cause a reduced ejection fraction. And I think we're going to need to figure out how do we monitor for that? What is the frequency of imaging? And could the AI uh, play a role in that. And even beyond that, I think that, you know, that's that maybe a, a, a surface application, but there's some great data, I think, by both by both you and, and much of our Mayo group that says that, that uh, use of the AI ECG scores can correlate with disease status when we look at those treated with these myosin modulating drugs. So uh, it can track alpha track gradient, it can track the uh, natriuretic peptide. So we may see a growing role for ECG and, and not necessarily clinical 12 lead ECG, but this AI uh, convolutional network uh, ECG tool. So one of the, the things that comes up, and by the way, I, I share your enthusiasm for this, obviously. And, it, and for people who um, are listening who maybe haven't seen it, essentially, it's now part of the Mayo electronic medical record that we get AI analysis of our standard 12 lead. So you order a regular 12 lead and it tells you probability of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and that score fluctuates with treatment or of low EF. And hopefully it'll be available at other hospitals later this year. Some of these are at FDA now. But one other question that comes up is, you know, we, we treat for symptoms, but we also treat because of the risk of sudden death. Look into your crystal ball. And I know this is a question about which the data are sparse to say the least. What will Mavicamptin do to the risk of arrhythmias, the need for defibrillators? How do you see practice changing there? Yeah. So the, the honest answer is a great big question mark. Um, so I think I, I, can, I can speculate, uh, but I, I think that we have no data for that. And for this drug that's not yet FDA approved, that we don't have long-term follow-up, that question um, is a big question mark. And I, I think that this could go one of a few ways, truthfully. Um, what we may see is that this drug promotes remodeling, that um, the biochemical signals that we see, the reduction in outflow tract gradient, this reduction in cross-linking, ends up changing the substrate of this disease and makes it less proarrhythmic. That's possible. I, I also think that we may find that this drug is not a good fit for some people. We've seen that, that potential for reduced ejection fraction, and we know from I mean, countless studies that ejection fraction is a marker of survival and uh, and correlates so well with other outcomes. And outside of a trial setting where we're following this so closely, that may be a harder signal to pick up on. And what if that carries some proarrhythmic effect? So to me, I think I think the jury's out. I think that the role of sept reduction therapy, myectomy, and alcohol ablation will will remain. But who goes to that and when will change? And whether this drug alters sudden cardiac death risk, uh, you know, maybe if we repeat this uh, podcast in uh, two to three years, we would have a lot clearer answer. Oh, I think we'll have to. Um, it's a very exciting area. It is literally the dawn of a new era for the management of this disease. And I'm going to close with one more impossible question because we really have such a little data. There's, there's very excitement. There's a lot of excitement around the new data we're having. And that is this, there are other disease conditions in which this mechanism of action may prove helpful. Diastolic dysfunction, maybe pulmonary hypertension of some forms. Uh, I'll ask you to speculate because I recognize it is speculation. Do you, do you see its use extending to other diseases and you know, what sort of timeline and what might we expect? as we look forward. Yeah, you know, one, one area that I think there's a, a large unmet need, and this doesn't yet branch outside of HCM, and I'll give you my thoughts on that too, but the non-obstructive patients with HCM, even though the trial that we discussed didn't affect the VO2 or the KCCQ, I wonder about more exploration of, of this new class of drugs within non-obstructive disease, because our treatment options there 
are so limited, right? As it, it may be the kind of a, a pure form of diastolic heart failure, wherein we hit the wall with therapies that we know that work, and then we end up moving on to advanced heart failure therapies. And a new pharmacologic option before proceeding to a VAD or transplant would, I think, carry a lot of clinical weight. Now, I think there are, are definitely diseases where this drug is, uh, I would be quite hesitant to proceed. You know, something like a dilated cardiomyopathy or where there's severe systolic dysfunction, throwing a negative inotrope and, and perhaps a, a fairly potent negative uh, contractility uh, agent at that could be met with, I think, a lot of untoward consequences. But I, I, I wonder more about, you know, uh, the, the restrictive cardiomyopathies, uh, you know, the, what, whether this could have a role in infiltrative cardiomyopathies. I, I think the, that, that will be uh, an interesting thing to look at. And even things like hypertensive heart disease, where it's not necessarily a primary cardiomyopathy, but there is a secondary driver. Now, I am not volunteering that any of those conditions are going to be receiving Mavicamptin from me should it be FDA approved. But I think that those are areas that could be potential avenues for exploration yeah. as we begin to learn more and more about a new mechanism of drug. Well, Jeff, fascinating topic. Thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, I'll look forward to when we circle back in a year or two to see how much we've learned and what we've learned. Thank you for your time. Thank you.